Hey guys, how's it going? This is Adam and you're watching an OrcadX how-to video. Today's video is going to cover the topic of how to manage your different net groupings in Constraint Manager. So what we're going to be talking about is when you have a large number of nets in the design, how can you start to group those together, for example, into net groups or net classes the, so that it's easier to assign constraints to them or even assign your constraint sets. <clears throat> I have here a example design, which we're going to be using. It's fairly simple. And let's go ahead and get started. All right, so before we jump into the actual design, I have up here a very uh, kind of easy to hopefully read and understand uh, diagram, which talks about how the inheritance and overriding works with constraint groups in ORCADX. Now on the top here, we have three columns named electrical, physical, and spacing. These are the different constraint domains which exist in uh, your constraint manager. So we have our electrical rules, we have our physical rules, and we also have our spacing and also the same net spacing rules. Now within each of these rules, you can either create or have different groupings. For example, uh, you can have two nets joined together to create a differential pair. And you can even have multiple differential pairs or even individual nets as part of a bus, for example. Now what this inheritance on the left side here is saying is that if you have a net class that is comprised of maybe multiple buses or multiple differential pairs, if you were to assign a constraint to the net class, then all of the members of that net class, those buses or differential pairs, for example, would then inherit the constraints that you assign to the net class. Now the arrow is pointing down. So that basically means that if I assign a, let's say that we have um, five differential pairs that exist in a net class, and I assign a constraint to four of those differential pairs. The fifth differential pair is not going to inherit that constraint because even though it is part of that net class, the net class is higher on the inheritance ladder, so to speak. So each of these differential pairs will individually receive that um, constraint, but the net class itself, I would have to apply the whole constraint to the whole net class in order for all five of those differential pairs to receive that, uh, that constraint. And that's kind of what this override here on the right is saying, is that if I apply a constraint to a net class and I override one of my nets, then it only overrides that single net without you know, changing the values of all the different net classes. And we'll see how this works in Constraint Manager, which we're right about to jump into. Um, I'll go ahead and include this nice little diagram in the video description. So if you want to download it and use it as a reference, it'll be readily available for you. All right, let's jump into the design. All right, so here you can see my design in Orcad X that I have opened. It's a very simple design. It's not actually manufacturable and it wouldn't work without maybe a couple additional things like power source. Um, but what it is, is a microcontroller. In this case, I believe it's a STM32 and an external SRAM memory interface. Now, what this allows me to do is use it for a couple other demos where I can show things like relative propagation delay and setting up like your total etch length and whatnot. But for the purpose of this video, let's jump into Constraint Manager and look at how we can start grouping some of the nets in our design. So like I mentioned before, on the left side here is where we have the three different domains. We have our electrical domain, the physical domain, the spacing, and the same net spacing domain, which kind of fall into the same category. Now in my design, I have, um, you know, a bunch of nets that you can see here. This color that you see on the left side here in the type is basically the custom color, which I've already assigned to these nets inside of Orcad X. Don't worry if you don't see these colors. This is only if you have any sort of custom colors enabled. Now we have here some power nets. We have, you know, the address lines, the data lines, uh, some control signals. We can start to group all of these and then it's much easier to assign constraints in our design. So I'm going to start in the physical domain because I think it's easiest to understand at least without um, needing to understand the design at a higher level. 
So we're going to go into physical, net, all layers. And this is where we can start to set options such as, you know, what is our minimum and maximum line width, right? What is, if we have a differential pair, what is the spacing between the members of a differential pair? We're gonna stick to kind of these simple ones just for the purpose of grouping. But let's start with grouping all of our power nets in our design. Why is it important to group power nets? Well, usually if you have power nets, you want the trace widths to be just a little wider, right? You need to support higher current. You wanna make sure that um, there's no IR um, IR drop across, you know, your long power lines if, if you have long traces for the power distribution. So here you see I have a 3.3 volt power net and I'm going to go ahead and use control on my keyboard to select also this ground net and these two VCAP nets which are connected directly to the microcontroller. And I can do a right click, create, and this is where I can find the different types of groupings. So we have class, net group, pin pair, differential pair, and physical C set. And some of these are going to be grayed out depending on what you have selected, right? So if I want to create a differential pair, I can only select two nets, but in this case, I have four nets selected. So it's grayed out because there's no way I can make a differential pair with four separate nets. So for this, we're going to go ahead and create a net class and we're going to call this power. Now, because we're in the physical domain, we have this option of selecting um, create for both physical and spacing. And that basically allows us to create a, uh, a net class that's going to exist in both the physical domain and spacing domain. So we don't have to create it twice. Let's go ahead and click OK. And here you can see that these four nets are now indented and exist under this little power dropdown. All right, so a couple more groups I want to make here. All these address lines, I'm going to create a class and call it ADDR for address. These data lines, right click, create class and call it data. And then we also have some control signals, create class and call it CTRL. And there we go. We have now our four different groupings. You can go ahead and collapse them. And now you can see we have the address grouping, control, data and power. Now let's go ahead and expand the data group and look at the line width constraint. So if I assign a constraint to the net class called data, we should expect all of these individual nets inside the data net class to then inherit that constraint. So if I set my minimum line width here to uh, 10 mils, you can see that automatically D0 through D7 are now 10 mils minimum line width. If I want to override any of these, for example, this D3, I can set that to 20 mils and you can see that it overrides the data net class, but it's only applied to the individual net, which I uh, overrode. So what this allows us to do is basically have very fine control over how we want to apply rules to the different nets in our design. And if we have, you know, hundreds or thousands of nets, it's very easy to start combining them into groupings and then to, you know, make it easier to apply those constraints. Let me go ahead and clear these really quick and we'll talk about um, constraint sets for the purpose of assigning uh, all of these, you know, different values. So if I, have, if I have a net class called data and I need to set the line width, the maximum line width, the neck width, et cetera, assigning all these can be, um, you know, quite an annoying task, right? You're, you're gonna have to type in 10 or 20 or 16, whatever it might be over and over and over again. So in that case, we might wanna use something called a constraint set. Now in constraint sets, if we go to all layers, we can right click on default and select create physical constraint set and call it, um, <clears throat> let's just also call it data. Or you know what, let's call this um, digital. These are gonna be the digital signals on our board. This SRAM interface, we're just going to assume doesn't have any uh, impedance requirements and is just a simple digital trace. And what we can do is for this digital uh, a net class, I'm sorry, constraint set, let's say that the minimum width is 10 the maximum is 12, the neck width is six, and the maximum length for the neck is, let's say 100 mils. 
So we've gone ahead and set those values. Now, if we go back into our uh, net grouping here, rather than typing these in manually into each of these cells, I can just say that for the data net class, we want to reference the digital constraint set. And here you can see that it automatically set the 10 mil minimum line width, the 12 mil maximum line width, and also our neck width and the maximum length of the neck. So we can also then say, well, our address lines are also digital lines. So let's go ahead and use the constraint set digital for our address lines. And same thing with our control lines, right? And if we wanted to, we could also create a constraint set for our power nets. So let's create a constraint set, call it power. And we'll say that the minimum line width is now 20. The maximum is 100. And let's say that it necks down to 15 mils for a length of 50 mils, just as an example. <clears throat> Again, we can set the power net class to use the power constraint set. All right, one more thing to talk about uh, before we finish up this video is how to use rooms in our design. Um, but before we do that, once we've actually set up these constraints, what this should now do is allow you to use those constraints while you are routing. So if I were to update my, DR my DRC, you'll start to notice that, well, we have some uh, line widths, which are not meeting our minimum neck width constraint. Or we can even start to use the command like the add connect command and set our traits width to use the constraint value. And then when I start routing, excuse me, when I start routing, you'll notice that this trace is automatically a little thicker. Well, let's just turn on our bottom layer here. And as I start to route and go to the target pad, let's go ahead and finish the command. If I hover over it, you'll see that the width is 10 mils. And this is our net name D7. And that is actually the constraint that we set in Constraint Manager. So we start to automatically use those values which we set in Constraint Manager and it's very easy to do because we grouped all of these nets into right that constraint set called digital. And there you have it. So the next thing we're going to talk about is rooms. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is how to use regions in your design or constraint regions. I accidentally called it rooms uh, a second ago. It is actually constraint regions. And what it allows you to do is create areas on your design where you follow a specific rule, which again, overrides any other rules which may have been previously set. So as an example, what we're going to look at is if you remember, we just assigned a constraint set called power to all the power nets in our design. And that constraint set basically said the minimum line width, let's just jump into constraint manager really quick. The minimum line width is 20 mils. And then we set some value for the neck. We're, we're not gonna worry about that for this example, but this 20 mil line width, if we start to route from here to one of these traces is a little too thick actually to you know connect to this pin. So what we want to do is to create a region around this IC where we're going to say, well, it's okay to go a little thinner on the line width because we need to actually be able to connect to the pin. <clears throat> So to do that is very simple. Let's jump into Constraint Manager again. We're going to go into our physical domain and then regions. And then in this uh, design row, go ahead and right click and select create region. We're going to call this our micro region. And in this micro region, we're gonna say it's okay for the line width to be in this case, I know it's 0.3 millimeters, and that should automatically translate it for us into mils. And the maximum we're going to say is, um, let's go and continue using that 20 mil maximum. Actually, you know what? No, for just, just for the sake of uh, clarity, we're gonna set the minimum uh, to 11.811, and then we're gonna leave the maximum empty, or I'm sorry, set it to zero. That way it's gonna stick to this minimum trace width. Now we're going to say the neck minimum width is, let's say six mils for a maximum length of hundred mils. And again, this is just an example. It's going to depend on how you set up your design and what your requirements are. 
All right, so we've went ahead and created that uh, region definition. And now what we need to do is actually define that region on our layout. So we're gonna go into the shape command here, add shape. In the shape use, we need to select constraint region. And we are going to work on the top layer for this example. Let's go ahead and make sure that our top layer is enabled. Yep. And the rule set we want to use is that micro that we just uh, defined in constraint manager. And then it's going to ask us if we want to draw it as a polygon, a rectangle, or a circle. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and select polygon. I'm sorry, a uh, rectangle because, you know, it's pretty easy to draw it around this uh, microcontroller here. Let's go ahead and draw it. Uh, like that. <clears throat> and now, since we have this constraint region, we should expect that once we get into this constraint region, it's going to allow our traces to follow that new constraint, which overrides any previous constraints that we may have set only inside the region. So we'll go into the add connect command. Again, we're going to be working on the top layer. Our trace width is going to follow the constraint. Excuse me, I'm recovering from a flu. And let's start routing from this net here. And here you can see that as we get inside of the constraint region, we automatically adjust our trace width. And if I hover over this trace, you can see that the width is 11.811 mils or 0 0.3 millimeters. And here you can see this is very powerful because it gives us very uh, detailed control over how we want our constraints to you know, work at either a higher global level or down to small regions, maybe for the purpose of connecting to small pins or avoiding certain you know, electrical interference um, criteria, which you might have. And this basically allows you to fully constrain a design uh, using only your constraint groupings, like your net classes, net groups, etc. Or if you have something specific on the layout itself, then you use regions. All right, that's it for the video, guys. I hope you liked it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those below, and we'll try to answer those as quickly as possible. And I will see you in the next video. Thanks again for watching.